Good morning and afternoon. My name is Tracy Cook and I'm with SACS Healthcare Communications. Before I introduce our moderator and speaker, on behalf of Stryker and SACS Communications, we would like to thank all of the frontline workers in our audience for your commitment and passion in helping all of us through this very difficult time. We are truly indebted to you all. Before I introduce our moderator, James Simmons, and our speaker, Bridget Joseph, I would like to show our audience how to send questions and comments. You have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address as many as possible during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Our moderator today is James Simmons. Dr. Simmons is currently an acute care Care nurse practitioner at UCLA Ronald Reagan Medical Center, Los Angeles, California. He is a guest lecturer at UCLA School of Nursing Masters Entry Clinical Nurse Program. He is an adjunct lecturer, acute care nurse practitioner program, University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing. He is co-host of Drop the Subject, a nationally syndicated talk radio program on radio.com and featured as a healthcare expert on numerous television, radio, podcast, podcast and social media programming. James, welcome. Thank you so much, Tracy. That was a fantastic introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So the title of today's webinar is Code Whispering, Nurse Driven Resuscitation Response. And speaking on this timely topic is Bridget Joseph. Dr. Joseph is a certified clinical nurse specialist and resuscitation committee nurse specialist. Currently, Dr. Joseph is the program director of the Emergency Cardiovascular Care Center at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Mass. She holds a concurrent position as Director of Simulation Education, Department of Nursing at the same institution. Additionally, she has worked in a variety of fields and specialties as a legal nurse expert consultant and an interprofessional education consultant, as well as conducting clinical research with focus on resuscitation. Dr. Joseph has been invited speaker at numerous medical conferences. We are very, very lucky to have her. Um, our speaker has disclosed the following financial relationship. She is a part of the Speakers Bureau for Stryker Medical. And continuing education for nurses and respiratory therapists, the, the best part, right? Everyone wants to know about all of this. So this educational activity is approved for one contact hour. A link to obtain your CE credits will be available at the conclusion of this webinar, okay? There's some accreditation information there for you also on the slide. And of course, we would like to thank Stryker for their support of this educational activity. So more particulars to come at the end, but let's get to it. It is now my pleasure to turn our presentation over to Dr. Joseph. Thank you so much, Dr. Simmons, for that lovely introduction. I'm going to talk to you guys today about code whispering, the nurse-driven resuscitation response. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the objectives and then hop right into it. And I'm going to shut off my camera for the rest of the presentation. So today we're hoping too that you guys get out of this a that uh, we describe, or I describe the importance of nurse-driven teamwork and the impact on team dynamics, discuss content, uh, concepts of interprofessional collaboration, and list collaboration skills needed to drive practice change at your institution. So to say that code events are my life is a bit of an understatement. James gave me a great introduction, but a little bit more about me is that I've been a nurse for about 20 years, a critical care clinical nurse specialist for over 14. Um, and my specialty has been in emergency cardiovascular care for uh, 10 of those years. So resuscitation is my life. And one of my big focuses is to improve responses, improve patient outcomes, and really to drive nursing practice. So at the beginning of this all, and when I started my role, I really wanted to do an assessment of the staff to see where we were. So I started doing um, a formalized in situ mock code program, and it was really my baby. I was obsessed. I ran one on every unit every month. Um, and every shift. We have 22 inpatient units at my hospital and it was really where I focused on. I wanted to drill the first five minutes of an event into everyone's brains, so it was clockwork. I really wanted our nurses to be a, 
a pit crew for every single event. So we ran them in situ and I drilled the same expectations and roles of responders. We pulled it into the simulation center, which is that middle picture there. Um, so we were hidden um, and we, I made it a part of annual competency days, bedside emergency days for novice nurses, any code training at the hospital. And originally I found some issues like nurses getting distracted, turning on the defibrillator, uh, or forgetting to actually use the defibrillator in the first couple of minutes, forgetting to uh, give any sort of support uh, for the ventilation. And one of my colleagues finally made me this sign that I'm holding in the last picture um, with matching earrings. Um, and it lights up in rainbow colors and I would just whip it out anytime we were in a mock code or any sort of training and someone missed a different relation. It just became a thing that no one wanted to see the sun, uh, the sign come out. Um, so I would <laughs> find things in mock codes and I would focus on them. Um, and that's what, how we kind of were driving and defining our care. So we got our we got our practice really tight, but it was a focus on the local units. And so I was reviewing these code blue events and it was, you know, like me staring with through a window with all these, you know, written things on it that you can barely read the uh, CPA forms. And I was seeing issues during events and thinking, why, why are these things being missed? Why are the handed off times so long at different points? Why were we shocking perfectly? And then the timing's getting longer and longer. And I really had my beautiful mind moment and realized that most of these issues were actually occurring after those first five minutes, once the entire team arrived. The nurses were just crushing it. Those five minutes, it was just boom, they were nailing it. And once the team arrived, we started to have some issues. So a new journey began for me. And I wanna to talk to you guys today about that journey of code whispering. And I hope you get inspired to, to make some changes and move towards a nurse-driven resuscitation. And I do want to give a little caveat that I recognize that there are nurses and respiratory therapists here today. Um, and for ease of me stumbling over my words, um, I'm going to refer to nurses a lot. Um, but I'm referring to to all of us as um, first responders. So resuscitation is a defining moment for a lot of people. Um, their true nature in emergencies really comes through. So we've all heard it screamed or we've yelled at ourselves, I need help now. And you know that moment when your patient is, you think they're great, they're ready to go home, and all of a sudden they code in front of you and you have that drop in your stomach and you're like, oh no, what is happening? So there's two types of nurses and techs that we've all worked with um, and therapists. So the folks here think, the first ones think, oh no, not today. I gotta give meds to room 12. And then you got the adrenaline junkies, they have fire coming from their shoes as they run in hot scream and they call dibs on the defibrillator. And I happen to rest the ladder, shockingly, um, but we need both of these types um, and everything in between to work as a team on a unit. And I, I talk about that because you can really flip the script um, and to create change. So when I came back, um, I was at my hospital for a while, left for a few years, came back as this um, role as the, the nurse specialist for the emergency cardiovascular care program. And I saw one of the nurses uh, that I used to work with in med surge, and I had already moved to critical care. Um, but we, So we'd known each other for 10 plus years at that point. And uh, I was surprised to see her still on the floor because She'd always talked about going to the, the surgical ICU when I was there, but she always told me, oh, I'm really bad in emergencies. So maybe the ICU isn't right for me. And I always told her she was bonkers because um, I'd worked with her in emergencies so many times and I never recognized anything wrong. So anyways, I was running a mock code on her unit a couple of days later and she was one of the first responders and I was absolutely blown away. I was, I felt bamboozled actually. She ran into the room we set off a tele alarm for the patient and it was supposed to be her new admit room and she didn't know they were arriving and they weren't because it was me. But she ran in and then with flames coming off her feet, ran out to go get IV fluid. And we, we, we never saw her again, I couldn't find her. And so I finally did find her, I stalked her at the end of the event and um, I was like, what just happened? And she said, oh, I get scared, so I run away. Um, and I get fight or flight, but I told her, we have to flip this script on your internal dialogue. You're a senior nurse. You can't run away from a patient that's coding. 
So um, unfortunately for her, we just started hitting that unit with mock codes, you know, and I actually tried to target her shifts. Um, and I don't think I ever locked her in the room, but I did have unit educator equivalents of bouncers to try and keep people in the rooms. And to say she was irritated with me at a minimum was pretty accurate, but she got better and better as we trained her. As we trained, her fear left and she started to go from flight actually to fight. Um, and it was awesome. And six months after that initial interaction, um, we had a conversation and she came up to tell me that her patient coded. She led the response, called the codes, started compressions and led the unit based response. And I was so impressed with her. She was beaming and I felt really fulfilled. Like this is why I do what I do. So I wanna to talk to you guys and change gears a little bit and move to hospital wide resuscitation because who cares about me? So I do have a question for you guys. Um, do you have a centralized dedicated code blue response team? Hopefully you guys can click in here um, with this poll. And if this is really for you call a code and other people come running. Um, and it would be, it must be nice if you do to know who's coming to a code. <laughs> but I'll give you guys a couple minutes to, or I'm sorry, a couple seconds to answer in here. And Tracy, do we have a, enough responses? Perfect. Oh, wow. A lot of you guys have a, a centralized code blue resuscitation team, 76%. I am blown away. All right. That is great. And and good for you to know who's coming to your, uh, to your responses. So I asked that of people because <clears throat> humans don't like change. Um, and one thing that remains constant in hospitals is that there's always variables. Um, healthcare is really based upon change and there's always gonna be change in resuscitation and really everything else. But it's important to keep in the back of our heads because as humans, you know, obviously we don't, we don't like change, but constant change can actually be detrimental to our physical health. And now more than ever, our mental health is super important. And constant change can lead to healthcare workers becoming less productive, less interested, increase of stress, negative impacts on sleep, all the bad things that we don't want happening can happen. So in a 2020 study that I have up here um, coming out of Sweden, they interviewed nurses, techs, respiratory therapists, physicians, and they looked at the characteristics for making success, uh, successful changes in practice and culture. And there were three resounding characteristics from all of them. One, being a part of the change and influencing it. So driving the change, some might say. Being prepared for the change, given time to understand and absorb it and process it, and then finding value. So while no one wants to change, they are way less apt to change if they don't see a need, which brings us to our variables here in resuscitation. So there are so many things that can come up in a resuscitation. And besides all of you lucky ones that, you know, have your centralized code team and may know exactly who is showing up for every single resuscitation event, and I'm very jealous, um, that there are many hospitals, including teaching hospitals like mine, that have a more uh, nebulous resuscitation team, as it were, because they want to spread education to residents and whatnot. But the code team responsibilities can be shared with various folks from department to, bar to department within a given shift. So one respiratory therapist might be covering the code pager at one point and another, you know, a couple hours later. Same with all the rest of the physicians that may arrive. So you think, who is coming? I don't know. How fast will they arrive? I don't know. My internal clock when I call for a code always is like fast forward and I know a lot of people do. Um, you have that adrenaline rush and a minute can feel like an eternity. I've done so many quality assurance reviews on events after it was noted in the follow-up that there was a delay to code team arrival. And really I'll find, you know, that it was actually three minutes, which isn't bad considering the size of my hospital. And we give the code team five minutes to respond because we're on two different campuses. 
So that's not great. What even is that rhythm? Nothing ever looks like what's in your ACLS books or the rhythm ID cases or you know whatever class you take. A a what is that? You don't know, right? And if you don't know, you throw the AED on. And if you're not sure, you use an educated guess. But if you don't know, you throw on that AED. And uh, it saves you a lot of time wasting, you know, your eyes on poor tracings. So the good news is AEDs have our back. But a huge variable is also family presence, whether you allow them in the room or not. I do, you know, just my soapbox here and encourage you to work with your institution to have them in the room if they're not. But even, um, that's a talk for another day, I guess, but knowing they're in the room or nearby or may have just gone out to get coffee or to get the car to bring the, their loved one home when they went into arrest, it's a variable that sits in your mind. It's an added stressor. And with everything going on, did we call a code? Where are they? It's only been 10 seconds, but it feels like an eternity. So there are these different things that happen, but there are some constants. So the constants are your unit staff. You know who you're working with. You know your colleagues, good, bad, ugly. You know you know that uh, the strengths and weaknesses, you know that Violet always likes to document, Sam runs for the defib, Casey likes to hop on the chest to do compressions. You know your team. And the basis of standardizing emergency equipment throughout a hospital is for the exact reason. That's a constant. It's standard, just like McDonald's. If you order French fries in Albuquerque, New Mexico, they're going to taste and look like the ones in Tampa and in uh, Japan. So this allows us to know when we crack the code cart, no matter where we are, we grab Epi from drawer one. It's in drawer one everywhere. And then BLS, it doesn't change except for when it does every five years, but I digress. It's the basic state of the same of BLS. We want early defibrillations or VF, VTAC and compressions that are high quality going at a rate of, I'm sorry, going at a depth of two inches at a rate of 100 to 120. And the final thing that remains constant is that whoever is in the room for the first few minutes before the code team arrives is the resuscitation team. And the number one priority is restoring cardiac function, and you are all a unified team working towards that goal. So working in teams is what healthcare is all about, and code responses are the ideal depiction of that teamwork. So I want to talk to you guys now about nurse-driven resuscitation. You're probably like, get to it already. Um, but <laughs> one, this is a team that we often overlook at the beginning of the code on the unit. And we do have a nurse-driven resuscitation team response. And despite this happy, lovely stick figure as our patient in the middle of the bed, who's so happy that they have the best nurses and respiratory therapists working on them during their cardiac arrest event, um, this is what we do. Um, we get things done. Nurses get things done, period. We call for help, start compressions, get the bed low and flat, place the AED, defib pads to assess for the need for a shock, give one if indicated, get the headboard off the bed, move the bed for the wall, get the suction set up, O2, epi ready on top of the cart, check patency of the IVs, get IV fluids set up and ready, and rotate rolls. I mean, that is a lot going on in a couple of minutes. Um, and that is a lot of coordinated teamwork. And that's what saves lives, early and fast quality BLS care using a defined model of roles and expectations of responders, and it creates an ideal choreography for these responders. And these direct actions that we do in the beginning of the event have huge impact on patient outcomes. Enormous. So I wanna think about that for a second. And then think about, we've had this beautiful code response, perfect choreography, working like a well-oiled machine, and all of a sudden the code team responds, and part of you is thinking, yes, they're here, help. And then we have some minuses that go along with that, because when we have more people and a larger response, there's kind of more input. We have our nurse driven, which is rainbows and unicorns working well, our constants in place, and then all of a sudden, the team can come and it can become pure chaos. And I'm I'm sure that everyone who's seen, you know, a cozy little code turn into a chaotic event and you hear, who's running this? Who's doing that? No one's listening. Everyone's providing input. And input's helpful sometimes. 
<laughs> not always. Um, it's helpful if it's good input. Um, and the other providers do help to fulfill roles, very, very necessary roles. We assist with the airway management and intubation, verbal orders for medications, invasive lines, IO placements, invasive procedures if we need it, like a pericardial synthesis. We need them. We just all need to speak the same language and work together in a respectful and meaningful way. So the team changes and you think about why. Um, and I always kind of, I always think about uh, the Joint Commission, our accrediting bodies. Well, I don't always think about them, but sometimes I have to. Um, and there's just a basic, when we try to give handoff in the hospital, and it is a requirement of the Joint Commission, and it's a national patient safety goal. It's been called out in Sentinel events in the past years, meaning it's something that these accrediting bodies will look for and something that's important. And it's something that we do, right? You know, you think about it, you send your patient off to x-ray, we communicate with the x-ray tech about the patient's status, change of shift, we give extensive handoff, you know, or a patient going to the ICU. Do same thing, extensive handoff. But in codes, and obviously things are different because of the timing of it, but we have a very brief transition of care and handoff. The nurses have been leading this resuscitation event and other clinicians just hit the door and there's no real handoff other than, oh, what's been going on here? And you give, you know, basically a, a half a line of what's going on. And they just begin leading the event. And I wanna just, I'm gonna give another reminder I am speaking in generalities. I'm not intending to speak poorly about any of our colleagues from different disciplines. I'm just pointing out a crucial moment that it can occur in resuscitation events and cause some issues. And for the purpose and ease of speaking, I also want to make a disclaimer, which I did before, but I'm going to be focusing and talking about doctors and nurses. However, this is translatable to all of you that are here listening today. So the team changes. We go from our constants that we can rely on to all these variables. And as you know, nurses, and one of the reasons I think about, again, why the team changes is that as nurses, we're taught to work as a team. Um, we give a lot of care and, we, uh, and it's easier if we have support. We can't do a full head to toe skin assessment on a patient with impaired mobility alone, for example, and coordinating admissions is a team event, especially in the middle of the night. Uh, and teamwork is the basis of what we learn when we are getting clinical experience as students and what I hope we all experience when we're working clinically. And physicians can be taught in a very different model. So I wanna focus on this for a minute, um, the, the future of nurse-driven resuscitation. Um, I love this for, for quite a few reasons. Um, and it seems to be, well, one, there's no crowding, right? <laughs> this is beautiful. There's no extra people and everyone has room. Um, but uh, a physician and a nurse are at the foot of the bed leading together, which is so important to me. And I think it should be important to everyone. The physician can, you know, give orders and perhaps for medications, but the nurse leader is standing next to them and helping to drive that tailored care of the patient between epidoses, shocks, another constant for most codes. Um, the nurse can give more patient-centered, pertinent information to help drive that care. So think about it. We know this patient better than anyone else in that room. Even if it's change of shift and you just got report, most likely you know more than anyone from that central responding code team that just hit the door. And not only is knowledge power, but knowledge and patient information communica uh, communicated correctly saves lives. And most often the code team responders are running in, responding to a brief, patient went into rest, lost the pulse, looked like VF, so we started compressions and shocked once like a minute and a half ago. And they take it from there. They don't know that much about the patient. They're responding to numbers that they're seeing on a screen and a rhythm. And it's much later in the event that we give them the full information about the patient, if really ever. And to hone in on my beautiful heart um, at the foot of the bed, but in this model of the response, the nurses are essentially code whispering, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but at the foot of the bed between interventions, we're sharing the most important pieces of the patient's past medical history, that they were therapeutic on Coumadin, which are always our favorite codes, right, when the 
patients that are therapeutic, we still have to determine if maybe they had a PE uh, when they transitioned to PEA, um, but that they were here for an outpatient workup for a new lesion on their left lower extremity. At, after the test, they became syncable with the recovery time, and the patient was admitted overnight for observation. They've been totally stable, ready to get discharge paperwork started when patient rings bell and said he started to feel lightheaded like yesterday again, right in front of you, unresponsive, you call a code. Imagine the ability for the code team leader to have that clearer view of the patient without distractions. They could get a clear and audible description of the event, and now the nurse can help further guide the ACLS response of this patient by having labs ready, other pertinent info at their fingertips. So as a code team leader may be thinking, electrolyte and balance, he can ask the nurse leader for information directly as they have the most intimate uh, knowledge of this patient. We don't need to shout across the room or assume they heard us correctly when they, you know, they ask what the patient's mag level is and we shout out and say, uh, you know, 2.3 and then they order a dose of mag and you say, uh, doctor, <laughs> I said that their level is 2.3 as we shout it across the room again. So you feel either dismissed or like they didn't hear you, but with you at, together at the foot of the bed, you can have that close communication, joining forces as leaders, and you're able to share information with each other quickly, effectively, and then with the rest of the team. So they might quickly share with you the reasoning for giving additional mag, and you have the opportunity for a little closed loop communication there. So in codes, there's so much to think about, and two brains certainly work better than one, with mine included these days. And in this model, we can share responsibilities of leading to optimize patient care and outcomes. So I just wanna, the future is kind of now, the future isn't far off. This can be done and implemented quickly. And I actually started, imp I implemented it somewhat by happenstance. Um, I was attending every single cardiac arrest for a very long time. And the residents started to refer to me as the code whisperer. They didn't always know my name and they knew blonde hair and they knew that I'd help them if they got in a tight spot. Um, and I would just stand next to them and help them make decisions. And I didn't, I wasn't invasive, but they would look to me and feel relieved when they saw me hit the door. And honestly, I wasn't really doing anything insightful or special. And I had my own code whisperer. So as I was walking into the room, or perhaps running, who knows, I would pull the primary nurse next to me on my way in and get the scoop on the patient, or I'd get the unit-based educator, get the scoop on the patient, and essentially, work the ACLS uh, algorithm in my head based on the information they gave me. So I started to think, why should I be the middle person? I, I'm just gonna start training the patient's primary nurse to take the position I'm in, feed the information to the team leader, Do, done. So it's not a particularly intricate idea or anything, you know, wow. Um, but the team leaders never really needed me. They just felt better having a second brain leading the resuscitation event with me. So I started changing gears on the training to make it more of a focus that the nurse that, fi that is taking care of that patient stands with the team leader. And I started changing gears on training and I made it a focus. It requires continuous reinforcement for current staff, education for new staff, but it's something that we strive to do 100% of the time. And I want you to think of this as a basis for the next little bit of my uh, of my talk here, and I promise I'm gonna land the plane. Um, you just have to bear with me on my journey about interprofessional education. So communication really is key, and when we work in any team, especially healthcare, the communication is crucial. Um, and actually, it's all the time pretty critical, but especially during an emergency when someone's life is on the line. So I want to do a quick polling question and find out. Um, about SBAR, so situational background assessment and recommendation. And is this the standard expected approach of communication between RNs, MDs, and other um, other folks at your hospital? It's a uh, good old SBAR. I think it came out of the military. Actually, I know it did. I did a little history on it. <laughs> And fun fact, it was the first time I was actually ever yelled at by a physician as a new nurse. I was screamed at to get it faster as I was just starting to get my one-liner on my patient. It was very sad. 
Uh, all right. Well, let's see how many people have chimed in here. Of course, look at that. Well, good. And I have no idea. That's cool. And <laughs> no. All right. Well, I'll be honest with you. It doesn't always happen all of the time. Um, so it's good to have that in the background. Um, and I want to talk about the biggest problem in healthcare, which is actually communication. Fancy that. So it's well known and documented that poor communication between team members leads to medical errors and serious adverse events in patients. So it's been known for years and years and years and years. And as you can see, there's tons. I mean, these are just snippets of a little bit of uh, research. There's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of research articles on communication and what issues it causes in healthcare. And at this at this point, actually, poor teamwork processes are considered public health concerns and preventable harm. So um, another national patient safety goal is to eliminate uh, preventable harm for patients, which means improving communication handoff and interprofessional communication is a key component that's a focus of almost all hospital administrators. It doesn't really translate into anything. However, <laughs> it's something that's recognized as important, broken, and needs to be fixed. So I wanna talk a little bit about microaggressions because along with these issues related to patient care and outcome is that negative communication interactions can also cause future micro microaggressions. And I'm, I'm sure everyone can close their eyes and imagine an interaction with another healthcare provider. It didn't go well and you think, what a jerk. And if you're like me, you have a mental list and no one wants to be on the list. It's a mental list of people I don't like. I will say as I'm getting older, which I don't like to admit, my list is shortening, but man, I used to have a, quite a list. And regardless, if someone's made you feel dismissed, unappreciated, less than, or disrespected in any way, you are more likely to not want to work with them and you are much less apt to help them in a team situation, which negatively impacts the whole team. So I'll say communication is important for interprofessional and interpersonal working relationships and for patient care needs, which is the ultimate goal of everything that we do. So it brings me to interprofessional education. You may have heard about it, you may have not, and you may have taken part of it, uh, taken part in it without even realizing it. So I wanted to talk about a study uh, that happened at the University of Washington, and they utilized the team steps approach. And team steps, for those of you guys who don't know, is a teamwork system to improve communication and teamwork skills among healthcare professionals. It's all research based, um, and it is a very well outlined program. And it basically this method of education was implemented with a group of 306 students. They use medicine, nursing, pharmacy, physician assistants, and they learned improved methods of communication. They went to three hour long simulations with debriefs and the most notable findings, um, and I bring this up for this reason alone, is that it was huge um, coming out in 2013, this research study, which I know is like an eon ago in research world, but it showed large improvements in attitudes towards key, uh, team communication, situational monitoring, um, and mutual support. Plus, they all felt better advocating for patients and communicating in interprofessional team settings. And it's so big and it's so impactful, this research, and it's still not the standard to educate using an interprofessional approach. And I sit there and I bang my head against the wall and I think, why? And one of the reasons is because humans don't like change. And if we just bolus teach something and never readdress it without changing the culture, it won't be sustainable. So I always go back to pit crews, and that's why I always have pictures of pit crews when I talk about resuscitation, because each person in that pit crew has a specialty and they all train together. They learn to communicate using the same language and they optimize what they do because they have to. They don't have the time. So the gas guy might not know what the tire guy does, but they speak the same language, which is why they are so successful. They train hard to know their roles and quickly communicate with each other. There's no ego, only uh, outcome-driven intentions. And if they can do it with race cars, why can't we do it with human lives at stake? Next, oh, 
Okay, so the benefits are insurmountable. Um, the one hospital in 2018 actually started to implement interprofessional training in the OR, which is a really easy group actually to uh, target because they're a specialty area and everyone works really closely together and it's self-limiting with the number of staff. So it's not training an entire organization. But what they found was that interprofessional training can create a team where there may not already be one in place and it optimizes communication between the team members. Plus it allows a safe space for communications and there's only benefits from it. Patients do better, staff feel better about events, and there's actually positive outcomes that happen right away. You know, you see all these quotes uh, on the on your screen here, and it's really impactful. And one thing I want to point out that they found in that study was the impact on the psychological safety. And I think a lot of us for a long time didn't recognize in healthcare how truly impactful that was. But I've been really focused on teamwork and communication and psychological safety also needs to be highlighted. And people like me tend to have no issues talking to whomever about whatever. I have something to say, so I'm going to wait my turn and respectfully share my information. But I know not everyone feels that way and not everyone is able to do that. So your psychological safety is huge for your comfort of speaking. You're not going to speak up if you think someone's going to yell at you or there's going to be some sort of retaliation or make you feel less than because you spoke up to advocate for your patient. And that negatively impacts patient care. And it's not OK. So IPE, interprofessional education, helps to reinforce an environment of psychological safety, which is the key to communication. If you can't even feel safe to speak, we can't even start to have a conversation, never mind actually communicate. So there are some communication barriers. We know it, we see it. And so these are some of the big reasons that we need to focus on IPE. As I referred to before that nurses are taught a little bit differently, we are, we're taught in an interdisciplinary way. Our days are dictated by coordinating labs and tests and family visits, procedures, patients' clinical stability or lack thereof, working with you know, respiratory therapy, PT, OT, voice, speech, and swallow, et cetera. We, every single one of those coordinations impacts the patient's day, visit, and their pending discharge. And it's a huge burden to hold, but we do it all while advocating for our patients and giving optimal care. And that being said, I think that the communication skills in general could be better taught for undergrad nurses and reinforce interdisciplinary communications. But physicians are traditionally taught to rely on their own colleagues as a team. They don't look outside of the physician group. So they look at nurses as a part, as an extension of the patient's caregiver. And same for respiratory therapists. Now, that being said, there are times they are a change in and some med schools are adopting different models of education to include interprofessional education and communication, but it's not standard. And in med school, there's a lot of focus on book learning and not a lot of communication. There's also the fragility of human ego and some people don't want to listen to others and think they know best at all times. Um, but um, they think they know everything that whether it benefits the patient or not. And I do want to point out any specialties that fall into this category. Um, we may know them, but I don't think we want to. Um, call out any specific specialties that have larger egos than others. Um, but these barriers can be worked with change. And by far, the biggest barrier is the difficulty of getting started and implementing uh, the interdisciplinary education. You want to have some champions to make a drive for this, make a change, and dedicate some time to changing culture and making a difference in patient care and staff relationships. So. Interprofessional training experience is amazing, but there are some big challenges. It's tough to schedule getting nurses, physicians, respiratory therapists in simulation at the same time. Uh, virtual learning has helped with this, but some, uh, but someone's always post-call, working, how do we pay everyone? Those logistical things that just kind of drive me berserk. But when we are able to pull those puzzle pieces together, the training is absolutely magical and I'm not even being facetious. So another uh, clinical nurse specialist and two attending hospitalists work with me, and we helped create this education uh, at my hospital. And we run the sessions together, we drive the change 
together. We take physicians and nurses and other disciplines and we get them on similar service lines to work together and we split them into small groups. So one group does cardiac arrest scenarios, one group does nursing concern, pre-rapid response scenarios, and we have them complete a couple of hours of pre-learning on the importance of teamwork and how to effectively communicate. And then we just make them come in and do it. Wash, rinse, repeat quite a few times until they understand their communications on both sides, how important it is and how the other person feels. And honestly, almost always the nurse feels really dismissed at the beginning of the of one of the nursing concern scenarios. They outline what's going on with the patient using SBAR. And a lot of times the the physician will respond with, okay, so what do you want me to do about that? And all of us running the scenario in the in the back just kind of roll our eyes because we expect it. The first time we were all shocked and then we were like, oh, this is a thing. Um, and then as soon as the nurse starts speaking her truth saying, I felt very dismissed by your comment. I didn't want to continue speaking to you. And I only did because of the patient. It's like a light bulb goes off for that physician. And there's also a portion where I feel like it's a coming to truth time, but the physician will start talking about their volume, uh, how many patients they have throughout the hospital and what their shifts are like, you know, 24 hours, 36 hours. And all of a sudden the nurse has a light bulb going off. So we create essentially a culture of respect and it impacts communication beyond what you can imagine. And we are slowly trying to infiltrate all education to make it a, a truly an interprofessional journey. And it is hard earned. But training as a team allows us to truly be a team no matter who shows up at our door. And there are fewer, there's been multiple studies, you know, over the years to support, you know, from sports teams, hospital teams, what team performance looks like and improvement. And to pull out a couple here, I wanted to highlight a, a systematic review of uh, from 2019 that um, surveyed team improvement performance. I'm sorry, that found that uh, team Teamwork improved performance regardless of the characteristic of the team and not the actual tasks. And that's really big. You know, working as a cohesive team improves performance and patient care. Trusting and communicating with others for one common goal makes us better. And what more could we want for our patients during resuscitation? Another uh, study from Europe found that there are fewer serious adverse events with optimizing team responses, fewer adverse events. To me, I hear that by optimizing team responses, we're giving our patients a better chance at a positive outcome. And I'm also hearing that working as a team focuses on our strengths and nurses as leaders, and we can change patient care for the better. So by working as a team, we're doing better for our patients, our staff are mentally doing better, and this leads to an improved retention of staff. So if you're happy and feel like a, a working part of the team, you're gonna stay. And we seem to understand this concept, like you, me, everyone's here, because you guys are here on this journey with me. But it's not always uh, the forefront of healthcare organizations, and they need to do better to understand the overall value of teamwork and emphasize approaches that improve that and make it sustainable long term. So the basic principles are super easy. It's leadership, communication, situational monitoring, so are things changing? How do we fix it? And mutual support. We all have different strengths and weaknesses. So we work together to support each other. And that's how teams do better for patients. And making a change. So let's think about everything that I've talked about so far. How do we get there? How do we make this change and move towards IPE? Um, this is a big one. So first, I want you to, if anyone gets this reference, I will dance, but stop, collaborate, and listen. <laughs> and truly, the real first step is to understand that we know and understand that there's a problem. The reason we're all here, that you guys are here learning with me and talking with me, is that we recognize there's a problem in our system, in our healthcare. But when we really stop and listen to our colleagues from various disciplines, are we hearing that they think this is a problem too, where we work? Is it a problem that maybe you just have? And maybe we feel we aren't communicating well between disciplines. So we gotta listen to other people and hear what they're saying. And also we need to hear ourselves and how we communicate during events. Maybe we could improve how we're going to communicate. 
and to try to collaborate with your leadership. So local leadership, resuscitation committee, to move this forward, to start working on IPE communication improvement. It's not a small undertaking overall, but small steps make a huge improvement in patient care and staff communication, really in morale of the entire team. And the second piece is to kind of keep your eyes open and have similar minded colleagues do the same. Don't stalk and actually look through blinds, but watch for an MD or a respiratory therapist or, you know, an anesthesi, well, I guess they're an maybe a CRNA at resuscitation events that communicate with nurses. They reach out to get feedback as they walk into the room to lead a code, not just what's happening and takes over the second you, you know, gave them the one liner, but someone who actually shows interest in communicating has closed loop communication. They may need not be someone who's involved with a lot at the hospital. And sometimes these little shining stars are people who are just awesome clinicians and, and, very good people, and they are the unsung heroes in making change happen at hospitals. Maybe a new resident, maybe an attending who's very woke to communication needs, but all it takes is for one person from a different discipline to work with you. So the characteristics, when we see that someone's a communication champion, you want to you want to find them that they communicate well, they hold themselves as a leader, whether they realize it or not. You're going to know that person when you see it. And code team leaders should be arriving. Our goal is that when they arrive, they ask, who's the patient nurse? Come here, can you tell me what's been going on? They should be really making eye contact to let you know that they're listening to what you're saying, giving uh, a handoff of leadership, and then invites others to communicate. Does anybody have any input on this patient? I'm out of ideas. <laughs> so, if you can find that person speak up and say, I have an area for improvement with the resuscitation events at the hospital, and anyone who cares about cardiac arrest and resuscitation efforts is gonna be with you. Communicate yourself. Reach out to those that you see can be collaborative and make a proposal. Saying something as easy as, the Joint Commission focuses on eliminating patient harm, and that's our goal as a hospital, to improve patient outcomes. Interprofessional communication can positively impact both of those. If your hospice magnet are on the journey, done. Interdisciplinary uh, communication is a huge focus. And we now know that teamwork and IPE improves care and staff morale. And even going to an administrator or a leader, a, a local leader, saying that nurses drive care for the first few minutes of an event, the team arrives, we're effective with our communication and we're essentially left out of the event as leaders, once the medical team leader assumes their role, we don't feel str strongly a part of the team. Are you willing to help me make that change that'll benefit patient care and staff morale? You're essentially making an offer that they can't refuse. You're saying, when you're talking to these administrators or physician colleagues, someone that's gonna support you, you're making a focus on essentially patient outcome improvement. And that's what's most important. You need to get a green light to start changing the culture and you need to speak in a way that they're gonna hear you. So making the patient outcome improvement the basis of this change is something that anyone who cares about patient care or has any vested interest in quality and safety can't refuse to support the work. So when you add in sub goals of decreasing errors with patient, focusing on elim uh, elimination of preventable harm, you're golden. And throwing in about improved staff morale to any administrator, they hear happy staff means retention, less turnover, better care. And having a physician champion supporting the work alongside a nurse is the basis of interprofessional care and makes it so much more impactful. So where do you begin? You really need to be the change. You need to lead by example. And I'm not sure if I can give you any more cliches here, but it's true. You need to live it, be it, start having those conversations with others, tell them what you want to do, tell them how you want to start changing codes. And it's not easy, but when you're at your next resuscitation, just go and stand by the code team leader, start sharing patient information in closed loop style. And even if they have no idea what you're doing and they stare at you like you're bonkers, uh, just give them the, just do it and fake it till you make it. Just take that, fake it till you make it moment in your life. So I am kind of running tight on time because I flew out of my uh, my internet, but I want to just talk to you quickly about changing cultures through practice. And I did reference this earlier, but really lead by example, talk about it with people, 
have people become your allies. And um, I want to make sure that you show, collect some data and show it. So it doesn't matter whether you're running a mock code or you're doing something on the floor or getting, you know, a quick survey response, but a simple collection of any sort of number of events show improvement. You want to show that to the resuscitation committee, to administrators, and after running these events frequently, especially in mock codes or in simulation centers, um, sessions, uh, people will start to see, feel, and absorb the change. And getting their feedback is really important so you can share it with administration and with your resuscitation committee. So just to quickly pull it all together, I want to look at this again, because the goal to optimize patient care and drive nursing practice is to be together and to have a nurse and physician lead together. It's a simple concept with huge impacts. The nurse hands off what they're doing to another responder, stands with the code team leader, and they run together. It takes something that is multidisciplinary and makes it truly interdisciplinary by collaborating together. We become formal code team leaders and we are always stronger together with one patient goal, which is optimal output. So one small change and one reason that I continue to do what I do is that I remind myself every day that better is better. And I mean that small changes can have huge impacts. So remind yourself of that often, frequently, and I thank you so much for spending time and being here with me today. Um, I'm gonna, this concludes my presentation and I'm gonna turn it over to James and he is going to talk to you guys before we begin our question about how to get your CEs. Thank you so much, Dr. Joseph, for a very, very awesome informative session. And um, just so everyone knows, we're gonna go over by five minutes. Uh, so that we have time to answer your questions because there are a lot of fantastic questions there. So we'll get to those really, really quickly, okay? Just uh, before we go on, a few reminders. There, um, this is obviously available for continuing education uh, for nurses and respiratory therapists. It's been approved for one contact hour. To get that, you're gonna go to www.saxtesting.com slash sl. And there is an emphasis on the www, okay? You do actually need to put that in to get to that website. So www.saxtesting.com slash SL. You'll need to register there, complete the evaluation form. And then once you submit that, you'll be able to print your CE, okay? This will also be emailed to you as well. So if you don't happen to capture this slide right there, you'll get an email for this, okay? We of course wanna thank Stryker for their support for this educational activity. Also, there is going to be an archived version of this, which is great, right? So you, other folks can go back and watch this. You can go back and watch it. The archive on-demand version will be available at savinglivesnow.org. An email will also be sent to you about that archived version. Um, and the on-demand version is available for nurses and respiratory therapists for CE, okay? Uh, so just as a reminder, it is about two till the top of the hour. So. Uh, we are going to go over about five minutes or so so we can answer some of your questions and i'm going to try to group and block a bunch of these questions okay because there were a lot that sort of had similar themes so dr joseph um you know this this you talked so much about communication and how important it is particularly uh, across interdisciplinary uh communication and there was one one question that i thought could sort of bring this all together um one individual asked are your leaders trained in your specific model um, to ask if anyone else across disciplines has any further recommendations before a code is called, before the code is done. And I feel like that's such an integral moment for communication, not only you know at the beginning, but of course, at what could potentially be the end of the code. So what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so we do. We follow, um, that is part of actually the AHA uh, ACLS algorithm and part of their communication team training. And so we do we do train that to a T. So they do ask, is there anything else? Is there anybody who has any suggestions in care of this patient um, to get some further feedback? Um, so we do focus on that, um, but that towards to be at the, you know, as we said, at the end of the event. Um, and really I'm looking what I look to do is to change and have that at the beginning of the event so that we can get as much information about the patient and have as much collaborative communication from the jump rather than waiting till the end when the patient may not be making it. Hopefully we can bring it back. 
Sure. And if there's a culture of communication at that point, then that communication's going to continue to happen throughout that code, right? So Exactly. And it's it's really intended to start the communication and to have it in the code event be optimized, but also it's going to bleed into other things. So so no pun intended. But to have it into, you know, all areas of care, maybe during a rapid response, maybe, you know, all other areas where there may be high stakes that we're looking to kind of co-lead and work together and communicate. Very good. I did want to mention to you, Dr. Joseph, by the way, several people in the questions and comments did get your stop, collaborate, and listen reference, oh. by the way. It, I'm not the only one who felt aged by that because I got it and I was laughing out loud. So lots of folks have wanted to sort of define a little bit more in depth and in detail, if you can, who exactly makes up your Code Blue team. Um, and if you can extend that as well, how are the responsibilities that you talked about delegated? So is the, you know, the primary nurse who's there on maybe a med surge floor, is that person, you know, do they get delegated a responsibility or are they completely taken out of the room? If you could just kind of talk about the structure of that team, how it came about, and then how those roles are, are assigned. Okay, so when we, um, the way that we assign the beginning of the code, uh, when the, the local unit is arriving, is that whomever hits the door in the order of first nurse, second nurse, third nurse, fourth nurse, they kind of assign the roles themselves. However, usually the first responder is the one calling the code, starting compressions. Second responder is the one coming and bringing the code cart, attaching the defibrillator, um, and kind of assisting the person that's doing uh, compressions. And then the third responder will be assisting to get the backboard out or underneath the patient and pull the bed out. And uh, I think it's all in the diagram there. And now I'm kind of spacing out on four and five, <laughs> but someone's documenting, someone is making sure that the room is ready, Epi is ready, everything is there to support airway. Um, and we do kind of push airway off a little bit, uh, especially because of COVID, that it's not one of the first things that we focus on. Um, but as the team arrives, the so the, the centralized code team, we do have two ICU residents, um, and one of them is the team leader, and one of them is backup. We have uh, anesthesia, anesthesia, two respiratory therapists, um, and then we also have um, some sort of administrative supervisor, uh, a surgery resident, and uh, we do have an ICU attending that stands outside the room. Mm. And that's the so basis, but people come in packs, so. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and speaking of COVID and people standing outside of the room, there were several questions here that people mentioned about, okay, what are we doing in the time of COVID, right? Um, and that, you know, COVID numbers are obviously much better around the country, but it's still a thing. It's still with us. Um, and yeah. unfortunately, there are a lot of COVID patients who code. And so are you reducing the number of individuals? Someone in the comments or questions actually said that they sometimes will only have four or five people in the room and everyone else is outside of the room. Do you have recommendations yeah. for that? Well, actually, that's what we are trying to do. We have we have one of now one of the nurses that responds on the local unit is known as a safety officer and they stand outside the room and they actually won't let people in if they don't have proper PPE and they also help to limit people. So once we have those four or five people, we have a respiratory therapist, anesthesia, and then a couple of nurses. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention our ICU nurses. We have two ICU nurses respond. So if we have the two ICU nurses, the two uh, nurses from the floor, anesthesia, respiratory, and then our ICU team leader, everyone else is outside and they actually, we use baby monitors to communicate uh, inside the room to outside the room so that they can, um, you know, assist with getting anything that they need. Um, and it does really, um, it does help having that communication and having people know their their roles and expectations helps to protect us in, in during COVID and surgery. Absolutely. 100% I agree. I actually have found that uh, a lot of our, we have a nurse driven protocol at my facility as well. And we've actually had better communication because of COVID yeah. with our codes now, because everyone has had to know that exactly what their roles and responsibilities are. So we have about one minute left. Uh, folks, if I did not get to your question, I'm so sorry. Our apologies about this, but hopefully Dr. Joseph, this question can kind of help you put a bow on everything and wrap it all up. This was a fantastic question, I thought. What would you recommend, and I'll give you a second to think about this, what would you recommend as the first three steps or the three most important steps to implementing a nurse-driven resuscitation protocol in your facility? I think that number one is finding an ally, uh, a champion to work with from a different discipline 
That's number one. I think number two is getting uh, support of your local staff. So uh, talking it up and making sure that it's not just an issue that you're seeing um, and, and maybe that's not local on your unit. Um, but then also focus the change working with your your unit leadership focus the change on your unit or somewhere small that you have somewhat control um, and that way you can gather data from that and then expand you want to really start small and so you probably feel like you're not really doing much but i promise it's really impactful you're going to make a small small change and then it's going to just explode because as soon as you can show any sort of data showing that you've made any sort of a response you bring it to leadership and you you just advocate for yourself and for your patients and for the the need for this communication and teamwork. Off off it goes, right? That always feels like the case. We start something very small and we're like, this is never going to be anything. And then the next thing you know, you know, you've really Boom. changed everything. It's fantastic. Dr. Joseph, thank you so very much um, for this. We thank this you, was Dan. awesome and fantastic. Very, very close to my heart. This is what I do. Um, <laughs> as well, everyone, we appreciate your patience with our technical issues early on uh, or you know, a little while ago. Uh, no worries at all. It happens to all of us, right? Um, I was talking while I was muted. You know, it's a whole thing. So uh, <laughs> don't forget, we have uh, some other housekeeping items. You're going to get emails about your CEs as well. And Tracy is going to go over our uh, closing housekeeping items. Again, thank you, everyone. We hope you have a fantastic day. Tracy, take it away. Thanks, James, and thanks, Bridget. We'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Immediately upon the conclusion of this webinar, you will be presented with an online survey. Please keep your web browser open, and we appreciate your feedback. In one hour following the conclusion of the webinar, you will receive an email with instructions and this link to obtain your CE credits at www.saxtesting.com backslash SL. And again, we'd like to thank uh, everyone for attending today's webinar and we hope you have a great rest of your day.